Welcome to Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to sit down with Councillor Karen Tang of the City of Edmonton, Alberta. Councillor Tang also serves as Director of Cities for over 500,000 for Alberta municipalities. But before we dive into our interview, a brief moment to acknowledge the support that keeps our show thriving. We want to acknowledge all of our new backers to the show. Tony, Mike, Lucas, thank you for helping us to continue to grow and bring more exciting content to you. If you want to join the growing list of supporters, visit crossborderinterviews.ca and pledge your support today for as little as $3 a month. Now, on to the show. And I want to start with the basic question. Well, first off, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. And I want to start with the big question, Karen, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Uh, well, was first of all, it's great to be on the show. You know, I've 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 followed it for a while, and I uh, really appreciate the long form, uh, conversational format you do have to kind of get into a bit of a motivation and aspirations for local politicians. Um, you know, I've I've always been in community organizing. Uh, you know, did a lot of you know uh, environmental organizing uh, work uh, when I was a university student. Um, <clears throat> And 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 when I you know graduated uh, university, I worked as a teacher, a middle school science teacher on the Navajo Nation in New Mexico, and I think there is was a quite a transformative experience, uh, seeing what it really means to be embedded, immersed, uh, working with community to to um, to to realize some of the goals that the communities have, um, and I think since then, since that point, since I experienced. Um, it, I think it just strengthened a sense of, I think, not not so much service, but sense of community for me uh, and what is my role, how I, how I can contribute. Um, you know, I've done a few different kinds of community organizing kind of roles in different places. <clears throat> Eventually, I was very interested in the in, in the in the field of community health, and that's what actually what brought me out to Edmonton. Um, and to study public health at the University of Alberta, and uh, and my stream, I guess my my um, what do you call you know my stream of study was really focused on uh, community health, social determinants of health. Uh, you know, not not so much just focus on data and epidemiology, which people tend to think about, but this notion of how do you create places, neighborhoods, communities, cities. Uh, creating environments so people can stay healthy and thrive, so people don't have to get sick, um, which is really what our healthcare system is designed to do. Um, and if you think about that, there's so much local uh, influences that happens in creating that environment. So that's kind of what got me interested in in local issues. And I've done a few different campaigns, also community organizing based, and seeing the connection between issues people experiencing on a day to day. Uh, and the connection to policy, specifically local policy, uh, really kind of demonstrate to me the power of people coming together and to again move forward towards a certain goal. Um, and I think, I think it's just been you no know, service, or you can call it service, or community organizing has always just been such a big part of my life. Um, and you know, in this role, I just feel I'm a facilitator, working with communities to facilitate a goal. So there's a word that you used quite often in that opening statement there, and it's the word community. And I want to sort of dive into that a little bit here before we get back onto the the life of a municipal politician. But what does community mean to you? What does the word community, because everyone can have their own definition. And it's a question I've been asking a lot of municipal councillors and mayors across this country. And it's fascinating to hear what they consider community is. So for you, counselor, for you, Karen, what does community mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, it's, you know, often a group of people and uh, sometimes it could be a group of people with with shared interest or, um, uh, or, you know, there's something they share in common, whether they live in a, 
in the same place, in a neighborhood, for example, or uh, professionally, they have a lot of similar kind of um, field of study. So, uh, you know, to me, the public health pra practitioner, there's a community here. As a teacher, I had a community of teachers to support one another. Um, and I, uh, and sometimes it's based on whether it's uh, culture or um, age, you know, the youth community, for example, is, is, is one I'm very close to. Um, but ultimately it's a group of people that 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 helps us feel we belong, uh, that 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 support us, that that's actually quite critical to our sense of well-being. That's good because it's gonna come up in the later later on in the conversation. I want to dive into that a little bit more about the community of Edmonton, which you represent. Mm -hmm. But I want to go back to who you are. And I want to know. Did you ever want to be a politician? Was that ever something that you would ever desired to be growing up? Was politics discussed at the dinner table? How does someone who has a background in community health, university, taught in New Mexico, end up being a counselor for the city of Edmonton, the capital of Alberta, Canada? It's a great question. I, <laughs> I often reflect on how I got to this point, and I've actually never thought about politics as a viable like a career path for me um why not up, <clears throat> well i grew up in china uh so you know as you know china isn't exactly a democratic society so we don't talk about politics at the table uh and even you know i i immigrated when i was quite young to the to the united states and even there i think as a typical kind of immigrant family we don't really interact with politics um, and I think my earliest memory of like what politics really means was uh, actually how I immigrated and the role, you know, our local representative played um, as, you know, as kind of a typical uh, politician might, uh, you know, my face. And, <clears throat> and I think, so that was kind of my life growing up. And I didn't become a Canadian citizen until 2015. And up until that point, I've always believed that power comes from the grassroots. This is why we organize. This is why we work at the community level because that's where change happens. Um, and I feel like, you know, not not very often do I see change happen from the top that truly benefit people at the end of the day. You know how it how it translates from the top to the bottom in the way that it was originally envisioned. So that's where I dedicated a lot of my effort is on the bottom. Um, and in 2015, when I got my right to vote for the first time in my life, I was in my early 30s, um, and that, that was a very empowering moment. I've never voted in my life before. You know, that year was uh, the federal election, and having that power was quite transformative. And, you know, I, and after my citizenship ceremony, I remember having lunch with my husband, uh, and, and I was like, wow, I can vote now. I can also run for office. Do we, did we know that everybody with the citizenship had that right to run for office? What a privilege, you know? And, and I think voting rights is a longstanding civil rights issue that many groups of people have been prevented from even accessing, even if they were the original people of this land. Um, and so I just think it's such a privilege to have that right. And I wanted to exercise. Uh, and, you know, given kind of what I mentioned, just in terms of my interest in, in local factors that influence our well-being and health, um, I wanted to give it a shot. And so, uh, you know, in 2017, uh, I ran for municipal election for the first time. Um, I love my experience. Um, I didn't win. Uh, I was running against incumbent. And, um, but I love the experience just of, talking to people at the door and it was very, it felt very grassroots for me. My campaign was very grassroots and I felt like it aligned with all the values I've ever lived um, in my, I guess my community ex you know, experiences. Um, and so with that, I'm like, hey, maybe this, maybe there is something here. And I ran again, 2021 and, and here I am. So there's a lot to unpack there, and I want to start with the basic question. And it's kind of a uh, it might be a it might be seem like a rude question, but I, I feel like you're up for it as a counselor for the city. You probably get questions all the time that just come out of nowhere. But there's an apathy in this country. There's a massive apathy in this country when it comes to voting, especially at the local level. But a new Canadian, 2015, you get your citizenship. You go out and you make that vote. 
it is your first vote that you get to make in 2015 federally. What was the desire to do that? Because I speak to Canadians from who have lived here all their lives, who have born here for generations have lived here, and they just don't see the desire to go out to vote. What was it about that first election for you after becoming a Canadian citizen that you went, you know what, no matter what, I'm going out to vote because this is our democratic right. And as a Canadian citizen, we have the right to cast our vote for whoever we want. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, you know, I don't think any one particular issue drove me. You know, I'm not particularly partisan, but I think it's the notion of actually participating in the democratic process. Uh, even growing up, you know, my 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 mother uh, didn't become a citizen until I was off to go to university. So I've never seen people in my family participate in that process either. Um, so it's, it, it felt very foreign to me. And then when I was living in Edmonton. Uh, prior to getting my citizenship, oftentimes when elections come around and people are knocking on my door, I'm like, ah, sorry, I'm a permanent resident. I can't vote. I don't care. And and Did I you hear that a lot in 2017 and 2021. Yes, ab- absolutely, absolutely. And I now know better. And I, uh, you know, I'm looking back as kind of some of my own responses to people. Just because you can't vote, it doesn't mean you can't influence change. It doesn't mean things don't affect you, uh, because it absolutely does, right? And my my own immigration process is a complete interaction with government policies. Some some of them, you know, very historical. There's some very historical legacy there, um, and without understanding the background and without understanding how uh, how these policies affect our day to day life, um, not participating also means you don't get a say. And I think the more I got, I guess, more I matured in my own professional life, um, the more I learned about kind of the interaction between policy and people's, you know, day to day. Um, And if I wanted to have a say, this is my most basic right. And you're right. I think municipal elections gets very little turnout. Um, And so in 2017, also 2021, you know, when I do meet permanent resident, um, I don't so much focus on are you who are you going to vote for you know are you going to vote it's more about what do you care about you know and uh believe it or not at the local level a lot of people care about a lot of the same things you know is my snow going to get removed is my grass going to get cut are there going to be parks schools etc um whether or not you have this particular right to vote um and for me i really believe that everyone does have a voice um we don't have to always agree those voices may not always yield the outcome you want, but it's part of the process of participation. And so I offer people a long sign, even if they can't vote, you know, um, I ask them to like, you know, uh, learn more about my, my 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 platform and then maybe talk to friends and family who maybe who might be able to vote, who knows, right? Um, but ultimately, if I said, if I do win, when I, when, when I win, right? Um, This is the platform I'll be running on. And these are the things that I feel really passionate about in this community. Do you resonate? Um, So I think for me, it's more the the notion of I've never been a part of this. um, And having that power actually made me feel more like I belonged. So in 2017, you're unsuccessful in your first campaign for city council. But in 2021, you you are you are successful, but it's a different campaign than 2017 because in 2021 it's COVID 19. You can't traditionally go out and door knock. If you do, you have to practice safe distancing, and the act of campaigning is completely different than probably what you originally were doing in 2017. What was that experience like, those two different campaigns and trying to engage with people and understand that you have to go out and talk to as many people as possible in 2021 under this uh, under the guise of the public health, health protocols that are being placed by the provincial government and the city? Because as someone who has a public health background, I can imagine you probably took it even more serious than some other candidates. I'm not saying that there were candidates that didn't take it serious, but I can imagine with your background, you probably did as much as you could to make sure everyone was feeling safe yeah and i think also just on the from an election perspective it was a pretty big difference because 2017 i was running against incumbent to 2021 that incumbent went to run for mayor also it was an open seat um and uh and in the four years in between i've continued to kind of uh be involved uh and i think my name stayed fairly 
uh, persistent. Um, but also we saw boundary changes, the war really changed. So there's a, a ton of change beyond the fact that we were in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, and so initially uh, we really focused on a lot of the digital methods that a lot of people did, um, social media, um, a lot of videoing and um you know, online conversations, uh, you know, back in 2017, I did a lot of living room conversations. This time around, they were just virtual living room conversations and and people would invite their family and friends and neighbors and, and we will have a little, you know, a Zoom session. Um, not quite the same thing, but it is probably the best that we could have done given the circumstance. A lot of phone calls as well. Um, and then when it did become uh, somewhat okay to be outside, uh, you know, we 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 just spent I spent a ton of time door knocking, you know, fully masked and fully uh, distanced, uh, and and just kind of because the weather was nice, so we would you know be outside. Um, did a lot of leaflet drops. So I think ultimately what I realized is uh, we're trying to be creative, but at the end of the day, uh, the most powerful method of engaging with people is still face to face, even if we're separated by a mask. Um, I would have to agree with you wholeheartedly on that. As much as these Zoom conversations are great, there's always something about that in-person sit down conversation where you can actually sort of play off the person and sort of gauge their body language with in as little square like we are right now. It's a little bit harder, but it's necessary for some things, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm I'm very mindful of people's comfort level as well. So if they don't want to <laughs> chat, and that's absolutely okay. And I say, here's my contact, please give me a call or email me so I can follow up. Um, but I think people were were happy to talk too, because, you know, everyone's been cooped up in their home. Uh, and uh, and so many people did, did welcome that. You are elected. In October of 2021, six years after you got your Canadian citizenship, you are now a city councillor for the city of Edmonton. This is a big thing probably for you and your family. What was that moment like walking into that council chambers the very first day and getting sworn in as the councillor for the city of Edmonton? Um, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a mixture of both, you know, is this really happening? Uh, <laughs> it's feeling very surreal, but at the same time, just very sobering. I am here now. Now what? You know what? What is all the information that's going to come at me? How do I actually effectively make change? What if I fail? Um, am I going to let people down? And so all the, it's a, such a mixture of all of those uh, sobering yet you know elated feelings. Um, you know, I think the the week leading up to uh, to the election day, uh, we had some really good get out of the vote uh, results and talking to people and, you know, just seeing some of the responses, even from hearing about um, how people have got out during advanced voting. So I think by that, by the election day, we had a pretty good feeling. We were feeling pretty good. Um, and so when it did, it was announced. Um, I'm not going to say I'm, I was surprised, but just really relieved that we did it, right? And um, and, and six years now in the making, you know, I started campaigning for the 2017 election. Um, you know, my first conversation was 2016 and uh, I was on mat leave um, or I, I was pregnant at the time and then I was on mat leave. So it's just been such a long journey. And so I felt more relieved than anything else and just so grateful for all the support I've gotten, not for that one, you know, three months of of really intense campaigning, but for years of friendship, of people, of of, of my support network, it's it, it it was just incredible. You're coming up to your two year anniversary of being mm. sworn in, and from that election night, what's been the biggest eye opening experience for you as a local official, local official, compared to what you thought the job was to what the job is actually, because. People get into municipal politics and they think they can change things overnight, but then they realize it doesn't happen overnight. As much as policy does change overnight, actually getting to that policy does take some time. So for you, what was that experience like and what was the biggest eye-opening experience for you to say, this is not what I expected when I put my name forward in 2017 and then got elected in 2021? Or was there anything and it was kind of what you thought the job was going to be like? Hmm. Excuse me. 
Um, the job was exactly what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and I know a lot of people are surprised to hear that, but I worked at the city of Edmonton for a couple of years as a project manager uh, on a social innovation initiative focused on the downtown core. So I'm very familiar with uh, you know, the the social development side of things, the, the complexity of a lot of these policies, uh, lots of experience in terms of like, oh God, we need change tomorrow, but it's just not happening. Uh, a lot of experience in knowing that some of these solutions require long-term investment, steady investment that might go beyond, you know, a four-year political term. Um, uh, and a lot of these things require patience. So, uh, kind of just having that experience was helpful because it kind of gave me a sense of how, how does an institution like the city really works uh, and how complex it is. Um, and then, like I mentioned, you know, in between elections, I was I've always been fairly active, um, and so a lot of the, um, you know, you show up to 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 events, to meetings. A lot of that I felt like is very similar to what I was doing previously, being involved in different boards, different d different initiatives, doing lots of community events. Uh, so a lot of that felt like it was just more. It was just more. The volume is just more, um, and your role is more. I mean, obviously your role is different, uh, but the sense of and the and the busyness of that uh, is is not. And um, and on the constituency side, you know, a, a, a lot of the things we get on a day to day basis, a lot of things, not all of them, are the things that I hear I heard about at the doors, whether it's during election time or or you know during the off seasons that we're just in the community, whether door knocking or doing conversations. Um, so not a ton of surprises there, I guess. Um, and and even, you know, we when we talk about, especially when it comes to women in politics, uh, you know, racialized people in politics, we we hear a lot about the challenges we face. And I will, you know, absolutely say they're there, a lot of the prejudice assumptions. Um, uh, and, and I think in my case, a lot of uh, underhanded discrimination, uh, which is quite, I would say oftentimes typical for, you know, in anti-Asian racism, um, which I think really came out during the pandemic as we saw as well. It made me reflect a lot about my own, um, my own identity and how all of that fits into the current context of politics. Um, I think I expected a lot of that. So I wouldn't say any of that surprised me. Um, and I did a lot of reflection, a lot of conversation with, within my support networks about well, what do I need to do to overcome that? What do I need to do to focus on the prize, which is helping people problem solve on a day-to-day -day basis? What are the small wins? Um, because I, I believe at the end of the day, it's your track record. It is your accomplishments. It's how, it's how you make people feel uh, that really matters. Um, and people will judge me no matter what, no matter what I say. And there'll be people who will never be happy, who will always be vitriolic, who will always gonna be angry, um, but what it is that I'm to focus on, which is you know, the platform that I ran on, the things, the values I brought to my campaign, how I how I function now as a counselor, um, and the relationships I have. So in a nutshell, I mean, the job was what I thought it was going to be. It's hard. Um, and I think the biggest surprise for me is, you know, oftentimes people kind of chalk things up to say, oh, there's just too much politics. Um, <laughs> And I think you, uh, you know, in this decision or in this issue or whatever, and you really, really don't soak that in until you're in this role. You're like, wow, the politics, the personality. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's how you work with people. That's what politics really means. Um, how you relate to people, how you how you talk to people. And um, I think the biggest thing that surprised me is um, what that phrase really boils down to, you know, um, I'm not sure if I'm getting that across. At, at you the, are, I, I, okay. I'm, getting, I'm getting it quite well, but I want to pick up on something because you're elected at a ward level in the city of Edmonton. I, 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 I would try to pronounce the name of your ward and you probably know it off the top of your head. What's the Got name of your, there yeah, you go. Yeah, um, it's called Gotta Heal. Uh, so you're elected to represent the people of your ward. Mm -hmm. But when you're sworn in, you're not sworn in as that only that representative. You're sworn in as an Edmonton City Councilor. 
So have you found the balance of representing the people of your, the people who voted for you, the people of your ward and the city of Edmonton? Because you have to look at all the issues as an Edmonton issue, but not forget about the people who have voted for you and the people of your community. So how do you balance the needs of your ward with the needs of everyone in the city? Yeah, and I think that dichotomy comes up in a lot of other contexts as well. I'm on the board of Alberta Municipalities, you know, and when you're a big city in the mix of that, how do you also think about the needs of smaller communities um, and make sure we're advocating with a with you know a province wide uh, lens? So I think it comes up to me all the time. I've certainly have been situations where uh, you're wearing different hats, um, but just in terms of our you know our city council. Um, I think it's a it's, I think it's a delicate balance. Um, but overall, I will say as a council member, our role is to hear as many perspectives as possible. And even within the ward, you know, you're gonna have all kinds of feedback on just like a single issue like tree planting, right? Some people are love it, some people don't. Um, and whoever you talk to, I think it's important to keep in mind that that's not the universal view of everyone. And I think it's the same thing at the city level. Um, and so I feel like my role has been more about listening to as many people as possible. Of course, I always really focus on my constituent, but I recognize that there is a much bigger conversation and you try to synthesize as much as you can. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt here for a second because sure. I want to pick up on something there. You say you want to listen to your constituents, but there's a time and place that you have to say no because some people and I'm I'm being blunt here but yeah. some people are rude and I've seen it firsthand that some people can be vitriol especially on social media some people can totally. be angry especially aiming towards municipal politicians how do you listen to everyone while understanding that there's a time and place that people have the right to be angry but if they want to talk to you in a professional dialogue they have to come and not be angry yeah. Um, or do you allow them to be angry because they have the right to be because technically they voted for you or they didn't vote for you and you represent them? Yeah. Number one, I find people are, are a lot less angry when you get on the phone or when you see them face to face. Right. And I think I'm sure you hear that a lot. Yes. Um, and I, you know, I recognize sometimes when people either call us and leave a voicemail or email us, they might be experiencing like the worst day of their life. Uh, and there is some, you know, natural frustration. Uh, I've been uh, just in my, you know, previous work or life experiences I've encountered people and and you know not politics related I've encountered lots of people who um you know they are angry at the system at the institution and they need an outlet and I learned to not take things very personally um and I think that's one of the things I try to stay mentally healthy um but you know of course when it becomes very abusive when it becomes like uh, you know, a lot of derogatory, when, when, when derogatory really comes out, uh, that's kind of when I, you know, we really draw a line. And at the end of the day, though, what I like to say is I'm a researcher by background. I came to the university. I did my master's in public health. Uh, I'm a qualitative researcher. I see those as data points uh, and, and no, they reflect a point of view. They are a data point. And my role is to uh, review as many and synthesize as many of those data points as possible. Um, some of them are going to be, uh, you know, a lot louder, let's say, than than others. And how do you stay, you know, objective and try to kind of look at what the policy issue is and how does all these how 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 do all these data points inform that policy decision? So I so I think that's kind of how I take my role, and um, you know, I really think about the context of. And and that I mean that's part of policy analysis. You is you you hear from as many people as possible, but there's also a lot of other inputs. There's research, there's jurisdictional review, uh, there is you know the political context sometimes often dictates also what happens, um, and that often isn't war specific, right? Um, so I feel like I've you know with some of these principles in mind and kind of methodology in mind, uh, it's it's been really helpful for me to kind of strike that balance. Um, and I will say, I, you know, I kind of take that, you know, same approach kind of at the provincial level as well. Um, I really strive to, to get out and um, connect with some of the smaller communities in my role at Alberta Municipalities. 
And what I learned is that actually a lot of the issues big, big cities face isn't unique to us. I and mean, there's actually a lot of synergy. There's a lot of alignment. Um, and how do you kind of work with all of that together for, for a common goal? Uh, you know, there has been some examples where, yes, wearing my city councilor hat, I will actually have a very different position um, than wearing my board member hat for a association that represents uh, a lot of communities, uh, urban communities across the province. And um, is it is it tough to juggle? Yeah, no, it is. It is. It, it, it's 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 a lot of I would say also relationship building. Um, it is a lot of converse. It is. I want to call it like emotional labor. No, not in a, in a negative way, but you have to put in the effort to to talk to people. Um, does yeah. does that weigh on the personal life of a counselor though? Because talking to people all the time, being so public with your life, because as a counselor, you're a counselor 24-7. You go out to the grocery store, right. you're counselor Tang. You're not just mom or wife, you're counselor Tang wherever you go. Does that weigh on you as a human just to just always be on and always trying to make sure you're presenting yourself? Because the moment a municipal counselor trips up, I guarantee you there's someone with a cell phone there saying, well, if the counselor can do it, I can do it as well because they're not following the bylaws. So is it weigh, does it weigh on you from a personal standpoint, the, the roles and responsibilities that you've sort of undertaken here in 2021? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Every day. And I will add a you know, an, another layer to that as well. Um, you know, I'm very conscious of my background as a Chinese Canadian, as a newcomer, as a racialized woman in all of this. And I think when I, if I mess up, it's not just Karen Tang messing up. People see that as representing entire community of people, entire population, which is not always, it's not, it's not always fair, but it, it does happen. We know that, right? And so it's not just like, I, I got to perform 24 seven all the time for myself, but I also recognize that I'm seen as a role model for, um, for a lot of people in my community. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that I would say weighs me down a lot. Um, but it's also something I feel like, uh, I don't know. I feel like it's a role that I've been kind of doing too, also prior to the election. So, I think it's important to live a good life, to be a good human. Um, and shouldn't we just do that all the time? Um, Amen and, to that, sister. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'm uh, so I mean, like we call it, are we performing 24 seven? I'm just like, I'm just living my life, you know, 24 seven. And these are the values and principles I hold. Um, and it allows me to be a good representative. Then great. So I want to turn to a subject that, because I'm just cautious of time here, I didn't realize it's been a half hour already, because this is how great these conversations are. Time just flies and it feels like it's been five minutes, but it's in reality half hour. And I want to know from you, and before I ask this question, I'm going to uh, caveat, caveat it by saying this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is her opinion. This is not a direction of counsel, a motion of counsel, a policy of counsel. This is her opinion. In your opinion, counselor, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Edmonton today as of recording this episode? I think the biggest issue are, are a lot of the social issues that we're facing. Um, no surprise. Uh, all major city and increasingly, you know, the the mid-sized, the smaller communities are, are 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 sharing a lot of those issues of mental health and addiction, uh, which I actually believe is, is such a critical, uh, we're we're at such a critical juncture right now, uh, and of course related to that is you know is housing and social support, um, and these are the things I think got me really interested in the field of community and public health to begin with. Um, uh, and and so you know obviously it's it's, it's very passionate. Uh, I have I'm very passionate about it, and I recognize we can talk all about economic development. We can talk about you know attracting talents and attracting you know investments into the city. Um, we're not going to get very far if we don't have a consolidated focus on some of on 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 moving the needle on some of these social policies. You know, and I know that these social policies are typically under the jurisdiction of the provincial or even federal government, mm -hmm. or in the case of housing, all three levels of government, as much as some politicians may not think that. 
how does the city of Edmonton address issues that are not traditionally in the jurisdiction of uh, the municipal government, like mental health, mental health and social services? Because it, 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 takes up money that you have to put towards infrastructure. So what's the city of Edmonton doing right now until the provincial and federal governments come to the table and help out to address these issues that are happening in your community? Well, I think first and we'll step in when we can, uh, housing, as you mentioned, it's actually historically not a city <laughs> jurisdiction. We focus on water, we focus on drainage, we focus on, you know, turf maintenance and snow removal. We don't, we, we build fire halls, we don't build um, permanent supportive housing or affordable housing. That's not, you know, our, our you know, the city jurisdiction. But someone had to step in when our numbers are, you know, skyrocketing, when we are seeing decades of um, uh, inadequate housing policy that makes us one of the lowest um, number of affordable housing per capita in the country. We're trying to remedy. So, so one, yes, we, uh, the city has um, over the years uh, see housing as uh, part of that social infrastructure that that you no, know, we are responsible for, for rec centers, for community halls, for for fire halls, uh, and now housing is part of that social infrastructure portfolio and. Um, and it's really critical. So one, yes, we step in where we can. And a lot of the funding that we do, you know, access is also matched uh, by other levels of government. So we use as a leverage for, for, for advocacy. Um, and that's kind of the second piece is advocacy. And I know people don't like to hear uh, when, when you try to say this is actually a provincial or federal responsibility at the end of the day's government, and we are all one, right? Uh, and even though sometimes, um, uh, in reality, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and so advocacy will always be on the table and we'll always try to uh, talk to our counterparts about why city of Edmonton is in desperate need. Um, and, you know, as much as possible, we focus on, you know, we focus on, you know, take mental health and, and addiction. No, it's, it's, it's a healthcare issue. It's a mental health care issue. We can't, we don't have the power, uh, the authority, uh, the legislative authority and the resource to to tackle any of that. But what we what we deal with is oftentimes the aftermath, the consequence. So we're always reacting to it. Uh, we invest in outreach. We invest in you know downtown and encampment cleanup, all of which are symptoms of much larger crisis. And so we we have to deal with that side of things as well. So I would say you know this is kind of three area we deal with the symptom. We try to step in where we can and leverage those dollars for root causes uh, with other levels of government. And we focus on advocacy. This is why, you know, I think being part of provincial associations are so important. There's a big cost of living ish crisis across this country right now. Things are getting more expensive to live and we're seeing it here in Alberta. And I just drove across Canada and I saw it firsthand in smaller municipalities. You're about to head into your budget session. If you haven't already started your budget deliberations, talk. We already about... did that. Oh, okay. okay. There you so are. Did... Four years, yeah. So we are four years. We did our budget deliberation last winter, and uh, and then every year we do a budget adjustment, uh, which is not quite as big as the four year, but sometimes still can be quite intensive. Exactly. So you're about yeah. to go into your budget adjustment sessions here soon, and sort of figure out where you are, where you're going to be in the next year. With issues around cost of living, does it make it harder to look at the future of what your city wants to be and where it needs to be while trying not to do it on the back of the people who are living right here and right now in your communities who are struggling day to day? Yeah, I mean, this is, I think this is kind of the biggest challenge any municipal politician faces is how do you manage your finances, uh, recognizing the world is changing. Uh, recognizing the city has priorities, um, but also um, do it in a way uh, that can, that doesn't necessarily place uh, unnecessary uh, over amount of burden on your constituents. Uh, this is the thing that we struggle with throughout budget and even now, and, and I recognize that. Um, so yes, Absolutely. It's a burden on me, uh, you know, during budget. I think I thought about that every day. Um, and then it came down to, well, you know, what is our tolerance? Um, and that means if you're going to have a certain tolerance, then 
there's a lot of things that, that, that won't be funded. So what things are you not going to fund? What things are you willing to cut? Um, the sad part is nobody wants to cut anything. That's, <laughs> that's the reality. And, and everybody wants to do more. <laughs> and so our role was to balance that out. And at the end of the day, sometimes I feel like when you take that approach, you don't really please anybody. <laughs> um, but that's ultimately our job. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think it's a lot of glamour being being out in the public but it's incredibly hard and you carry the stories of people you meet on a day-to-day -day basis um you know i'm hearing a lot of people in my in my in my communities who are now you know you know they talk about people stealing food from the grocery store from uh, the fast food and and not paying and i just think it's a reflection of the current crisis we're in our food bank is uh, Max again, you know, uh, and is seeking so much donation. Our 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 shelters at capacity for the summertime, which is unusual, um, and we have more and more encampments popping up. And um, what is you know what is, I am just that burden. I I live with that every day. And what is you know what is happening with our our uh, our world? And it's a reflection of some of those challenges. I want to turn to a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart, uh, and that is tourism. I love tourism. I, I, I have a very passionate person who believes that yeah, you should be spending your economic dollars here in your own backyard and spending it and going to see the great things that are happening within our own province, within our own, own country. So as I have listeners across Canada and around the world, I know you're going to say go to the West Edmonton Mall because that's a big tourist draw. But what are the hidden gems in Edmonton? that you enjoy, that you say, if there's a person that comes to our, my community, even my ward, you need to go see this because I think it's it's truly the embodiment of what Edmonton's all about. Oh my gosh, there are so many. <laughs> there are so many, you know, <laughs> like when you were, um, I guess a few things when, you know, when you were talking about that question. Um, first, I think, you know, as the festival city, we have a lot of things to celebrate across the city. Uh, and, uh, you know, Fringes this week, we just have Folk Fest, some of the largest in the country. Um, I don't know if people know that, but that's pretty incredible right here. Uh, we have, we've been having lots of downtown celebrations. That's also important for downtown vibrancy. Um, so, you know, for the first thing I'll say is, you know, these are some of the exciting things happening in our city that people should really check out. We've had some, you know, certainly permanent installations that um, I I would love more people to access. You know, we have an award winning uh, Indigenous People's Experience at Fort Edmonton Park. Um, this is a one of a kind in the world, uh, and uh, it's an incredible exhibit. Uh, and I and I think people really need to check that out. Um, and I, you know, I'm really interested in this notion of um, how do you really start to create uh, different parts of the city that have this unique. Uh, charm and and tourism appeal, uh, you know. During the Junos, for example, um, I thought the partners, including uh, led by Explore Edmonton, did a great job of uh, doing various concerts across the city. It wasn't just concentrated. It wasn't just a single event at Rogers Place. It was across the city, you know, including a concert uh, in my ward. And how do we start to create these nodes across the city so that? Tourism isn't just a downtown thing, it's really spread out. And if I think about my own ward, we have such a rich history and diverse cultures. Um, this is a bit of a sidebar, but one of the things I'm, in, I'm really passionate about is involving the public in making financial decisions together, not kind of your typical public hearing, but co-creating. And a project that we're um, doing uh, two years in a row now is called community-based budgeting, uh, where I ask residents, what do they want to do? And we make decisions together about how to allocate a certain pot of funding from my ward office. Um, and we see lots of great ideas and great projects coming forward. And one of them uh, this year, uh, is called the Millwoods, um, you know, food and culture tour. And it's, you know, we have, there is just so many different, um, and then last year we did something called Mill, like Greater Millwoods Dining Week, um, all of which really focus on the hidden gems in, in, in this part of Southeast Edmonton. Um, and, you know, if I have visitors, that's a, those are a lot of the places I would take them in the ward. A lot of delicious restaurants that doesn't necessarily always make it into, you know, the Avenue Magazine top restaurants or whatever, um, but has such unique stories of um, 
of, of founders and, you know, restaurateurs. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of my, really my vision and hope for the future of tourism in our city. Well, when I'm up there for the Alberta Municipalities Conference, we should go out to a restaurant in your community and see it firsthand because I you've just painted a picture that I want to go to your community now and see some of these great uh, restaurants. But before I let you go, I want to ask one last question. And it's kind of the most important question uh, that I probably have asked this entire episode. And that is, in your opinion, what makes the city of Edmonton such a unique place to live, to work? and to raise a family. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm not born and raised in Edmonton. Uh, I moved here in 2012 to pursue my graduate studies. And uh, somewhere along the way, I saw an ad in the Wars magazine. And you probably have heard this, and I think lots of people have used this line, where if you want to live in the city, move to Vancouver, Toronto. If you want to build a city, move to Edmonton. And I really felt the essence of that um, as a graduate student, as a community member. I felt that I was getting involved in a lot of initiatives. Um, and because I was new to the city, I had a fresh perspective. People welcomed that. Um, and I that, and that was how I was able to get involved really quickly and actually see change happen uh, in my community. And yes, we have lots of great things here. Um, like the River Valley, cost of living, you no know, affordability, housing. Uh, we're still one of them. We're still probably the one of the most affordable uh, city uh, in the country. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's this essence of, you know, we welcome you if you are a newcomer, if you have fresh talents and fresh perspectives and ideas. Uh, we want to do this with you, and you have a say. You get. You have a role in building this. This plays up. Um, and I think it's that essence and that spirit that makes Edmonton so unique, at least to me. And I want to see more people um, be drawn uh, by that spirit to come here. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's always a pleasure to sit down with local elected leaders and hear about them, but hear about what drives them. And it, by our almost hour long conversation so far, I can tell you that it sounds like you have a deep passion for your community. And I appreciate you taking time to talk to me about your passion, your community, and well, tourism. So thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to taking you out for uh, for, for for dinner in, in, my, in, in my ward. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay talking. <laughs>